has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. Yes, He's done great things. So we pour 
can worship the one who we emulate to be like our good good father has he been a good father to you has he kept you has he provided for you has he opened up doors for you is he your good good father let's give him a round of applause right now hallelujah thank you Jesus we're gonna pray over the needs that are in the house and for those who are watching online and we're going to pray over the service we're going to ask that God will move in a mighty way in a special way that he would have his liberty that he the, the hearts that came in today that are broken those that are in need of, of salvation those that are in need of a word from God you would receive it today in the name of Jesus let's bow our heads let's lift our faith to our King and let's pray and ask him to come down in his power and his might right now. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we love you today. We thank you for bringing us into your house one more time, Lord God. You are a good, good father. There is none like you, Jesus. We can search this world all over, Lord God, and never find another like you. You are so good. You are so great. We just want to pour out our praise on you right now. We just want to worship you in spirit and in truth. We just want to worship you with all of our hearts, Lord God. Come down and meet your children, Lord God. Come down and walk among us, Lord God. Come down and touch hearts, Lord God. Come down and free minds, Lord God. Right now, break chains in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord God, we look to you, our author and our finisher of our faith. Lord God, we need you right now. We need you in a supernatural way, Lord God. Come down, Lord God, and meet your children right now, Lord God. Tear up, Lord God, every agenda, Lord God. Move among your children in your mighty name. Lord God, we seek your face. We seek your face right now, Lord God. Have your will and your way in this place. Give us the victory. Give us a testimony right now, Lord Jesus. Give us the victory right now, Lord God. Move like only you can. In Jesus' name we pray. Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Speak. 
Jesus Over every heart and every mind Cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus
in our lives right now the power that comes with your name Lord the power that comes when we speak your name Lord oh What a peace in knowing that if you just speak his name, he's right there. And I feel that today there's a church of believers here in this house that have declared his name over their lives. There's a parable in the, in the Bible that talks about the love of a father. It's one of my favorites, favorite stories in the Bible, but I feel like it, it's going to speak to somebody today. There was a man who had a son who was lost, was gone. He went too far. He was living with the pigs. And if you're a parent in the room, father, mother, you can identify that there's nothing you wouldn't do to save your kids. And just think if, if that's how we feel as a fleshly father or a parent. How does the King of Kings, our Heavenly Father, feel when he knows that someone might be lost and he would do anything? He would cross any ocean. He would do anything to save them. So if today perhaps you're in the room, you're thinking, I've gone too far. God can't reach me where I'm at. God's love is unconditional. And we're here to remind you today 
that he's calling you home, that he loves you. You're in a room full of people that love you. So why don't you just, as a sign of unity and love and support, just reach over, put your arm around someone. We're going to sing a message of hope and love today.
I thought it was over, now I'm home. Yes, I'm home. Now I can dance with my family, celebrate with friends. If a song that was lost has come home again, now I'm home. I'm home with you, Jesus. Yes, softly and tenderly, Jesus is coming. He's calling for you, He's calling for me. Come. Come home. He's a good, good father. He's a good, good father, welcomes me home, oh yeah, you welcome me home, you're a good, good father, it's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, I'm loved by you, so it's who I am, it's who I am. Who I am, you're a good, good father. I'm gonna say, who you are, who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. You're a good, you're a good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are. Just a moment. Just stay in the moment just a second. I know there are needs all over this building. Would you draw close to someone around you right now and just lay a hand on a shoulder? This could be a day they come home. I'm going to keep Brother Barnett in our prayers. He's got a procedure this week. Some of you have been praying with him. Just lay a hand. If you have a special need in your life, just reach out for two or three around you and say, would you pray with me right now? I believe our Heavenly Father, the same one who said, suffer the children to come unto me is saying, I want my family around me right now. I believe the blessings of the Father are in this house. I ask you to pour out your blessings, O oh Lord. If you're not little flock, it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, the righteousness, the peace, and the joy in the Holy Ghost. With his stripes, you are healed. With his provision, your table is now full. Whatever you lack, he can restore. Whatever is missing in your life, he can put the pieces back together again. I pray your blessings on everyone in this house and those that are watching online right now. I pray the glory of the Lord in this building. Let the strength of another world come into this house. I pray your blessings, your provision, your power, your peace, your anointing in the mighty name of Jesus. Now, would you put your hands together and let's just give him praise in the house. Can we do that? All over this building, just give him praise in this place. Hallelujah. Just remain standing one moment. Ushers come ahead. I want to say, I want to say what a privilege to be in the house of the Lord today. Didn't it look good to have all these guys on the platform? I was missing some parts. It took me a while to figure out what was going on up here. I know all of you are much more perceptive than I am, but it figured it a while. I, I thought, where are the girls at? And then I started trying to remember on Mother's Day, was it all girls on the platform? And then I just, I got all confused and I got flabbergasted and, and 
and frustrated and flustered and and uh, it I just I finally said I'm gonna stop thinking about that I'm just gonna praise the Lord and uh, but what a privilege to see all of you happy Father's Day to all of you men and thank God for strong men in 2022 amen amen leave that the ushers are coming all over this building uh, I want to say thank you we are wrapping up the month of June, and, and it may just be June to you, but for us, we're tallying all of the giving that goes out of this church to missions projects. We make a report at the end of June 30. If you would like to make a commitment, I want to thank God for uh, two of our men, uh, Clifford Pereira, Chad Harper, who were overseas and uh, brought back a tremendous report that we got to listen to Friday. Thank God for the reach of this church all over the world. Thank God for that. Be faithful in your tithes and offerings. This summer is going to be a good one. Let me give you a, a ushers go right ahead and, and then you may be seated. Uh, let me just give you a, a few things that's happening in the next few days. And um, there's no first steps today because we want every dad in the building to have the privilege of offering up those burnt sacrifices to the Lord over your grill. And uh, we want you, men, we want you to be smoky before the evening comes. We want it to take days to get the smell of the charcoal. I, I didn't say tobacco, I said charcoal out of your hair and clothes. And we want you to have a wonderful Father's Day. Um, but there's no first steps today. We'll combine steps three and four next Sunday, the Lord willing. Everybody say VBS. Oh my, Vacation Bible School. This is a highlight. This is the last week of registration online, firstchurch.com. Volunteer deadline. You have reached your expiration date today. And that's because we have to go through some logistics and hoops to make sure that you're qualified to be a volunteer for VBS. That is that you have an IQ of over 160, that you're grade A, pasteurized, homogenized, have a good housekeeping seal of approval. Really, we have to run a background check. Okay, that's what that's all about. And uh, this is the daytime B, uh, VBS from 9 a.m. to 12 noon. We do ask you pick up your children at high noon and uh, or other things will happen. Uh, next month is Serve Day. Uh, this is a national project that we join in. Uh, no, we don't get to choose the day. It, it shall be. I prophesy. A spirit of prophecy has come upon me. It shall be hot. And uh, yeah, <laughs> it shall be. And, uh, and so we want you to be a part of it. On the seats, on the chairs today was a, a QR code on a red card. If you would scan that code and uh, to learn more about it and to sign up for a project. We want you to be a part of it. Hey, Elise, it's good to see you. I see you over there. It's good to see you back. Everybody say, Elise, come home. Okay, anyway, I, I got in trouble for that right there. And, and, and we want Michael, too, to come home. Okay, all right. And, uh, but we want you to learn more. Sign up for a project. Get something going. This is our part. The mission of this church is simply others, others. And this is our way to affect our community. To learn a little bit more about Serve Day, we've got a short video for you. Would you take a look at it right now? got the mac and cheese. I told him that's been the first time ever that that's been my cue to walk up to the pulpit. So we're doing new stuff today. Thank you all for being here. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers. Happy Father's Day to all the mothers who get the day off, right? Uh, uh, 
I, I've been a part of a couple of interesting conversations this week um, regarding the difference in Father's Day and Mother's Day in the church. Now, on Mother's Day, what we do is we tell all the ladies what a good job they're doing. We read out of Proverbs what a, what a good woman is, and we say, and you're doing that. And we, we hug everybody, and we love everybody, and we just, just applaud mothers, and mothers make the world go round. On Father's Day, it's always different in the church. Father's Day is beat up dad day. You lousy, no good scum. You're not doing all you should do. And I, it's, it's been such a topic of conversation that I actually, there's been posts on ministers forums about it. Uh, there's there's a, a, a video meme going around and it's Gordon Ramsay and it, and it says, pastors on Mother's Day. And it's him with all these little kids and he's patting them on the head and smiling at them and saying, that's so delicious. That's so perfect. You've prepared the perfect meal. And then it flips and it says, pastors on Father's Day. And it's him just throwing food and turning stuff over and screaming at all the cooks. And so I am not here today to beat up on dads. So you can relax. We're not going to do that. It is far too common. I have come with one purpose and one plan for this Father's Day. I want to extol the virtues and sing the praises of every single committed godly dad who is here this morning and watching online, who brought his kids to church, who will get up and go to work in the morning to provide for his family. Let's hear it for godly fathers. You deserve that. You deserve that. And look, I know, I know that there are a thousand different stories in this room. I know that Many of you were raised in almost perfect circumstances. And I know that maybe more of you were raised in less than perfect circumstances. I know that some of you had or have a great relationship with your father. For some of you, there's a lot of issues and baggage and trauma there that if we had time, we could walk through and unpack it all. I know everybody has a different story about dad. But whether your dad was a hero or whether your dad was a mess, whether you today are a dad and you feel like you're knocking it out of the park or whether you feel like you can't even get a bunt to go forward, whatever your story is today, it does not change the fact that part of God's divine, holy, ordered plan from the beginning of time was to create a role for men in the kingdom of God to raise godly children, to build godly homes, to set godly examples. And I just believe that we're in a church of people today who are doing their dead level best to follow the order and the ordinance of Jesus Christ to do everything we can do to be all that he's called us to be. We'll address some of the issues with dads today. I promise, I'm not just gonna I'm not just going to pat you on the back, but my primary aim is to tell you that the hope of the future is housed in the hands of every dad who was just clapping under the Lord and who was singing his praises and who was just praying over his family and leading his wife and his children into the house of God and the presence of God this morning. I want to read you a scripture, Proverbs 20 and 7, as we set out into week three of this roller coaster ride series. The righteous man who walks in his integrity, blessed are his children after him. Look at somebody around you and say, it's not just about you. The righteous man who walks in his integrity, blessed are his children after him. The walk with God that you and I secure today determines the level of blessing on tomorrow, determines the level of blessing on our children, determines the level of blessing on our grandchildren, determines the level of blessing on generations that come from us. And by the way, that's not just for dads. That goes for moms too. That goes for people who aren't parents. It goes for anybody under the sound of my voice 
The decisions that you make and how close we all choose to get to God today very much shape the future that's following close behind us. The level of relationship that I build with Jesus Christ is perhaps the single greatest predictor of my children's desire to know Jesus in the future. Now, we're talking roller coasters, and if you have missed the last two weeks, either of them, you need to go back and you need to catch up because we have talked about some of the craziness of this life and the craziness of the world in which we live, the highs and lows, the ups and downs of life. Today, in week three of this series, I'm going to preach to you on this Father's Day the most dreaded words that any father can hear at a theme park. Are you ready? It's this right here, five words. Daddy, can you carry me? <laughs> Daddy, can you carry me? Two years ago, Christmas, I still remember, because you remember trauma, right? We were in Pennsylvania, we were at Hershey. It couldn't have been more than two or three degrees, it was freezing. We're cold, it's kind of just misty in the air, we're wet, it's getting dark, and we're all the way in the back of the park. And Loren looks up at me with forlorn eyes and says, Daddy, my feet hurt. And I say, baby, we're a long way from the gate. We'll just take it real slow when you need to stop. But Daddy, I have blisters. I didn't even know she knew what a blister was at that time. I have blisters. Can you carry me? And so I did. I hoisted her up. And feeling like I was on a battlefield, I slogged through the frozen wasteland of Hershey Park, and I carried her. I remember my first real taste of fatherhood. Right after we had our first baby, Paisley, it was rodeo season, and you just go to the rodeo when the rodeo's in town. And we parked out close to 610. Got a terrible parking place. And I bought one of those contraptions because I was going to be prepared to be a dad. The thing, the harness thing that you put on that wraps around you and you, you put a baby in it. Yeah, that thing right there. Do you see that? I bought one of those. And I thought, this, this thing only weighs about eight pounds. I've got this. It was unseasonably hot. And I dropped the little baby in the cute little carrier. And by the time I got about six rows away from my car, I was already starting to sweat. And I just thought, well, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going, keep walking. By the time I got to the entrance of the rodeo, every stitch of clothing on my body was soaking, dripping wet. And I thought, this parenthood thing is not for me. I was not called to this. Now, I know, I know, ladies, that you carry that baby around for nine months. And, 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 and I, know, I know it's hard for you, but you've never been a dad who, for the first time, slips on that harness in 90-degree weather and puts that little eight-pound baby in it and starts walking from the car. I know childbirth is hard, but ladies... Ladies, one of the most grueling and difficult tasks of my life was walking with that little eight pound baby. Look at some more of these pictures. Look, look at these guys. Look, they're smiling, but they don't mean it. Look at that. He's posing for a picture. It's all cute. It's not cute. Look at this guy. He looks like he's going to a war. He's ready. He's carrying a sleeping baby. Carrying stuff is hard. It's just hard. Even an eight pound baby on a 90 degree day, it's hard. Or I guess we'll grant you ladies that did it for nine months. It's, it's pretty hard. It's pretty hard. I was done after about 20 minutes. And I thought, why didn't we bring that high tech stroller with us today? Why did I think that this was the way to do it? But for, for any dad in this place today or anybody watching online that's ever had that, 
That tired little face look up at you and say, Daddy, can you carry me? When you pick up that little baby, you are doing one of the most valuable things you will ever do in your life. Because when you start carrying that baby around, it's hard to do anything else. It becomes your, your entire existence centered on the idea that I, I, I've got this tiny little thing that I've got to take care of and got to keep safe and got to shelter. So let's start this way. Dads, if you're a dad in this room today, would you stand with me right now? I want you to look around this room. I want you to look around at the carriers in this place. I want you to look at the men who have carried that baby eight pounds on a 90 degree day and also carried their family and also brought their family to the house of God and also provide for their family and also take care of their wives and love their children and love God. I want you to look around at the miracle that is standing in this room right now. God chose this. God chose you. You can be seated. Thank you. You deserve that hand. You're in the house of God. You brought your kids. Older dads, your, your kids may not even be here today, but you've taught them and invested in them a lifetime of lessons. I am tired of it being culturally cool to beat up on dads and to beat up on masculinity and take aim at men as if they're the problem with society. And, and, yeah, that's fine. You, you can go ahead and clap for that. It, it's... <laughs> In the roller coaster reality of this day and age, about the biggest cultural outcast that you can be, and the biggest rarity that you can be is just a normal guy. Just a normal guy who loves his wife and stays with his family and plays with his kids and worships Jesus and does a bunch of manly stuff like grilling steaks and hunting and fishing and building fires. Just a regular old ordinary guy. Culture loves to take aim and point at you as if you're the problem. You're the weird one. I'm going to do everything in my power to raise my son to just be an ordinary guy serving an extraordinary God. I want you to see this video about my little boy right here. Check this out. A bulldozer. What is it? It's a bulldozer. It's a bulldozer. It's a bulldozer. What? It's a bulldozer. It's a bulldozer. It's a bulldozer. But much. I showed you that because we live in a world that loves talking about toxic masculinity and talks about the patriarchy and talks about all of this stuff that we love to beat up on and say that it's weird to teach your little boys that they should like bulldozers and they should like getting dirty and playing in the mud and I just feel like it is time for a group of men a group of godly men to say, you know what? We are going to teach our children to be who God called them to be. We're going to teach our boys to be boys. We're going to teach our girls to be girls. We're going to teach them to be masculine if they're boys and feminine if they're girls. And we don't have to be repentant about that. I'm tired of that right there being a target for every misguided, bizarre mindset that grips the hearts of America. I'm tired of it. You, you start doing that stuff and somebody will line up to lecture you about misogyny and the patriarchy and toxic masculinity. The problem in our day is not toxic masculinity, it's missing masculinity. Missing masculinity. The danger of fatherlessness. 
There's a psychotherapist named Joe Stapp that I read a lot of his work. He's an interesting guy. And in 2020, he compiled this group of studies from the Department of Health and the CDC and the Census Bureau and the Department of Education and the Justice Department. Let me walk you through some of what he discovered. 63% of youth suicides are from fatherless homes. It's five times the average. 90% of all homeless children are from fatherless homes. That's 32 times the average. 85% of all children who show behavioral disorders come from fatherless homes. 20 times the average. 80% of rapists come from fatherless homes. 71% of all high school dropouts come from fatherless homes. Researchers at Columbia University found that children living with a poor relationship with a father are 68% more likely to smoke, drink, or use drugs compared to somebody with a healthy relationship with two parents. Daughters of single parents without a father involved are 53% more likely to marry as teenagers, 71% more likely to have children as teenagers, 164% more likely to have a premarital birth, and perhaps most shockingly of all, 92% more likely to get divorced themselves. The problem with all of those statistics is that there's another statistic, and it's that almost 50% of U.S. children live without a father. 85% of children who are in chemical abuse centers, children and young adolescents, are from fatherless homes. 85% of men in prison grew up without a father in the home. School shooters, let's bring it to a present reality. Did you know and were you aware that 75% of school shooters were raised in either severely dysfunctional or entirely fatherless homes? The conclusion of all of this data is that the single greatest determination and predictor of adulthood stability is the presence or absence of a healthy father figure. There is incredible danger posed to the next generation by the dysfunction of a current generation. Now, I told you I'm not here to beat up on dads because you're here. You're here. But I also can't completely remove myself and distance myself from the reality of the world in which we live and minister. Now, I know in this room, I can take you to stories of people who are walking every day with God that were raised by single mothers, that were raised without a dad in the picture. But I promise you, you won't have to look too far until you find a figure that stepped into their life and mentored them and showed them the way and stepped into a role that a father abandoned. An entire society is set up for failure when there are missing fathers in almost every story. But let me tell you what truly worries me and why I preach about it today. It's one thing to just shout at the darkness and talk about how bad it is out there, and it is bad, and we know it, and we've seen it, and we've lived it. But let me tell you what worries me and why it makes its way into a sermon on a Sunday morning on Father's Day. The repercussions of naturally absent fathers is well documented with all the data that I just listed to you. But equally obvious to those of us in ministry and those who have spent their lives around the church is the unbelievable spiritual repercussions of fathers who are absent spiritually. There are a lot of fathers who are physically present, and maybe you're even here today, that you've been there for your children, you've been present, you've taught them to love bulldozers, you've taught them to balance their checkbook. Does anybody even balance a checkbook anymore? I don't know, I don't know. You just, you just open your app and look at it now, right? 
You've taught them to make good decisions and you've taught them to save money for the future and you've taught them to, to play and have fun and, and all of that. You've been present physically. But my question to the church today and what I want to challenge all of us is that there are a lot of us who are present sometimes physically, but we're very distant spiritually. There's a lot of great dads that are setting positive examples for their children in the natural, but we're leaving it up to somebody else to show them what their walk with God should look like. Let me, let me take you into the simple fact that God calls men. God calls men. It's been in his heart from the beginning of time. You can trace through your Bible. Anytime God intended to start a movement, he would send a man. He would send an evangelist into a country that nobody had ever preached before, but they would go and churches would be born. He would send kings and priests and prophets to, to declare truth and to declare the judgments of God on a generation. He would send men because God calls men. God intends to use men. Let me show you in the Bible what a man of God looks like. Men of God. First of all, your identity as a man. If you're just a guy in this room, all this is for you. 1 Corinthians 16, 13, men should be strong and act like men. 1 Timothy, men should be providers for their household. 2 Timothy, men should be competent. 1 Timothy, again, men should be prayerful and they should be peaceful. That's just if you're a man. God says if you're going to be a man and you're going to be a man of God and you're going to live my way, you need to have all of those characteristics oh, yeah. in play and in place in your life. Second thing, let's go from identity as a man to identity as a husband. Husbands, from 1 Peter, are to live with and honor their wives. Ephesians, husbands should love their wives. Corinthians, husbands should lead their wives. Colossians, husbands should be kind to their wives. And all the ladies said amen. amen. All the men said amen. amen. If you are going to be a husband and you are going to say, I am pursuing God, then all of that has got to be present in your life. Let's go beyond that. Identity as a father. Genesis 18, 19. Fathers are chosen by God. God chose you. If you're a father, God chose you to show their household righteousness. Proverbs, fathers should instruct and lead their house. Fathers should train their children. Ephesians, fathers should discipline their children. Thessalonians, fathers should encourage their children. Now, I've just read you a long list of what the Word of God, what your Bible and mine says, are the characteristics of a man of God. Now, you know and I know that there are days that some of those, if you created a checklist, some of those... Uh, you'd check them off, but some days you wouldn't. Because the reality of life is that all of us struggle sometimes. But it doesn't remove the fact that God spoke to men, and God spoke to husbands, and God spoke to fathers. And he said, if you're going to be mine, if you're going to be my child, then there are some expectations that I have for you. And it's to show forth holiness, and to show forth kindness, and to lead your family, and to guide your children, and to love your wife. And if you can't do that, don't say you're mine. That is the call of God to every godly man. Why, why, do you, why do you deal with that? Why do you bring all of that up? Well, I had to spell it out for you because there is a problem traditionally in the apostolic church. For far too long in the church, family spirituality has been led by women. Every week at this church, there are at least three women's prayer meetings in the prayer room. I don't know of a men's prayer meeting in this church. At least three here. I'm not talking about all the others that are happening around the city. I'm talking about here in the building. At least three different groups of women meet to pray in this church on their own. We didn't set it up. We didn't tell them they needed to do it. They just wanted to. For far too long, the spiritual head of households in church, contrary to the word of God, it has been my experience and my observation for years that the prayer warriors in the church, they tend to be women. 
The Sunday school teachers, they tend to be women. Most of the worship singers tend to be women. Most volunteers in this church are women. Most small groups are led by and attended by women. So you see the collision on this roller coaster of life that I'm preaching about today. We've got the call of God on one hand for men to rise up and lead and show the way and set the example. But we have our experience that we've lived out from childhood that you walk into any apostolic church and I promise you if we counted right now, there's more women in this room than men. Ministry is led by women. And if we are going to truly be the men of God that we say we are, then what we assert ourselves into in every other area of life, the one missing piece is it is time for the men of God who are raising their families and loving their families and showing up at church, it is time for the men of God to truly stand up and lead their households spiritually. Not just financially, not just behaviorally, not just habitually, no. But in every way spiritually, it is time for men of God to rise up and be men of God every day and take the lead and say, you know what? My wife is not going to outpray me. My wife is not going to outread my Bible. My wife is not going to outlead my children to know God. It is time for the men of God to arise and be what God is calling us all to be. Don't save it for a men's conference. I love going to men's conferences. You know why? Because guys just get fired up. I mean, it's there. We, we are, we're grilling in the parking lot and everybody, we, we, we kick off the music at a men's conference, and I'm telling you, the whole crowd will just be jumping and praising and worshiping God. But you come to church on Sunday, and you got your wife and your kids or your grandkids and your friends around you, and we settle back down out of our men's conference frenzy, and we settle back into our ordinary routine where men are out-worshipped and out-prayed by women each and every day. I'm not trying to set up a competition in this room, but if I thought for one minute that it would work, you better believe I'd try to do it. I'm just, can I just say this? I'm not going to let any woman out praise me, out worship me, out preach me, out lead me. I'm not going to do it. Why? Because God chose men to lead and it is time for the men of God to rise up and say, you know what? We're going to lead. We're going to take the challenge. We're going to accept the challenge and we're going to lead our families. We're going to lead this church. We're going to lead ministries. Men should set the bar of prayer. Men should set the bar of worship. It's divinely ordered of God. And when we don't do it, we're out of order. We're out of line. One of the most grave failures of the historic apostolic church is that the movement has been led forward by spiritual women while men often sat on the sidelines. And I, I gave you the list of prayer warriors and Sunday school teachers and worship singers and volunteers and all of that. You know what's dominated by men? Corporate America. Corporate America is dominated by men. The workplace is dominated by men. And that's, that's godly too. That's God, that's God ordered and God ordained. But there was not supposed to be a wall that said men lead in the natural, but women lead in the spiritual. There's not a wall, there is no wall of division between the two. Men are supposed to lead in both. Yes, you need to provide for your family, but yes, you also need to provide an example of the greatest spiritual relationship in your household with God. It should be you, sir. It should not be your wife. It is not God's plan. God intended men to lead the spiritual trajectory of a home. And any time that a woman finds herself in the place of having to lead a house spiritually. That doesn't make her a bad woman. That means there's a man who wasn't doing his job. And again, I'm telling you, I'm not trying to beat you up. I'm trying to challenge all of us that it is time for every man, every father, every future father, every grandfather in this place under the sound of my voice to say, you know what? There is more to it than just the natural. The most important thing I will ever show my children 
is how to worship God and how to love God and how to be in relationship with him and how to come into his presence with thanksgiving, with joy in my heart, with, with a spring in my step, with a song on my lips, with a praise coming out because I know he's worthy and I know that's what God called me to. The failure of masculinity is not limited to school shooters and incarcerated delinquents. I am more concerned with the fact that there are many in this church today who had good dads, who taught them to ride bikes and manage their money and make good choices, but who missed what mattered most. And that is the highest calling for every single father in this place. If, if my children, if my children learn to be successful in business and they marry the right person and they learn responsibility and they learn to do well in school. And if I teach them to navigate the ins and outs of society and relationships, but I fail to instill in them a love for the house of God and the people of God and the God of the house, I may look like a winner by every other metric, but I have failed the test that mattered most. It is my responsibility to shoulder the weight of carrying my family further and ahead and into the future when it comes to what matters more than anything else. And that is our relationship with God and his people and his house. That is your job. That is my job. And we can't afford to miss it. We can't afford to fail it. I told you it's popular to talk about toxic masculinity right now. What's truly toxic is the lack of masculinity where God most intended it. Men, provide for your family. Yes, do it. You better do it. I, I read it to you from a scripture. It's your job to do it. But if all I provide for my family is a paycheck, I am missing my highest calling. What is the biblical calling of men? It's, Daddy, can you carry me? Daddy, can you show me what worship looks like? Daddy, can you tell me about fasting? What's fasting, Daddy? Daddy. Daddy, can you, can you tell me why when the preacher preaches, why does everybody go down front and, and pray when it's over? Why do they do that? Daddy, can you, can you tell me, why do people cry when they feel Jesus? Daddy, can you tell me what's, what's different that I feel in this place from any other place that we ever go throughout the week? Something's different about, it. Daddy, can you tell me? Daddy, can you carry me? Sir, that is the highest calling of your life. From generation to generation, for your kids, for your grandkids, for children that you don't even know yet down the hallway in the wave, worshiping Jesus right now. It is our job to set the bar and set the example and show the way and say it is a joy to be a man of God in this place. It is a joy to be called to fatherhood. It is a joy to be called to leadership. It is a joy to be asked to be an example for the future. Your God could have stepped into this world and identified himself as anything, and he chose Father. He chose Father. He didn't choose to be called King. He didn't choose to be called all the other things that he could have primarily identified himself as, and he is all of those things. But he said, I am your Father. I'm your Father. I'm not just... I'm not just your boss, I'm not just your king, I'm not just your high priest, I am your father. Yes. And it opened the door of relationship that mirrors a relationship of a loving father to their children, but it also opened the door of example of what we are called to be like. What sets the example for me as my father, I, I've, got, I've got great men in my life. My father, nobody's ever done the job better than my father. There's no better father on this planet. My father-in-law, there's no better fathers than those two guys right there. And they set a great example for me both naturally and spiritually. But the highest example, when I wear the title of father, the highest example and what matters most to me is my heavenly father. And we better all realize and recognize today that that is what we're called to emulate. That's what my life is supposed to be like. Let me love my children and my wife the way that God loves you. Let me lead my family the way that God leads his church. Let me be an example of sacrifice and generosity the way that God gave himself. A God who could have come as anything came as a father. 
which makes it really easy to preach this on Father's Day. Musicians, come help me out. I'm, I'm coming to a close. Ray Kimbrell and his wife, Nancy, were both officers in the U.S. Marines. When their son, Patrick, was born, it was their dream to have a baby, and Patrick was born, and before too many days, they realized that something was not right. Patrick was born with cerebral palsy, was the diagnosis after a time. And Ray had spent his life dreaming of being an officer in the Marines. He had 172 men under his command. But when he found out his baby boy had cerebral palsy, he laid down his greatest dream to pursue what he would later describe as the dream that he didn't know he needed. Kimbrell left his life's work of leading a platoon of Marines to devote himself to his son. He committed to be present with him every single day, from wheelchair to walker, and when Patrick wants to do something, Ray Kimbrell puts Patrick on his back. Summer camp, buddy, let's go. Ropes courses, I'll carry you. Camp class in the edge of a waterfall just stumps out of the ground from side to side. Ray puts Pat on his back and says, buddy, we're doing this together. Why? Because Ray knows that nothing matters more than carrying Patrick as far as he can into the future. Ray says it reminds him of the confidence course in his marine training. The hardest few days of training that anyone could ever hope to face, of carrying things through impossible circumstances and situations. But the rule is nobody gets left behind. And he said, I realized that if I can make that commitment to my brothers, I had to make that commitment to my son. No one stays behind. Here's what Ray Kimbrell said. The Marines were just part of God's plan to prepare me for the most important duty of my life, which is being Patrick's father. Daddy, can you carry me? My altar call today is very simple, if you'll stand with me. I'm gonna give an altar call for men in this room. And ladies, I hope you'll join us and pray for us all, but I wanna give an altar call for fathers, for future fathers, for grandfathers, for men in this room. My altar call is simple. If you're a man in this room and you have got it in your heart to do whatever you have to do to carry the future of your family, of this church, and of the kingdom of God into a brighter day and into a greater relationship with God, will you move from where you are and just get down here as fast as you can? If you've got that on the inside of you, if you say, you know what, I'm making a commitment today, just move from where you are and join me at this front right now. We're not gonna take long. I know you got plans on the day. But I'm just wondering if there are some men who would step across the line and say, God, here I am, send me. God, whatever you need, whatever you want, I wanna be it. God, whatever you need me to carry, whoever you need me to carry, whatever example I need to be to my family and to my, to my children, to my wife, to my grandchildren, whatever ministry I need to be involved in, whatever way I need to lead and set an example, God, I hope you'll give me the strength to step up and stand out and do it in this place. Could it be that every battle and every trial and every struggle just might have been God preparing you with a confidence course to set you up for the most important duty of your life, which is the call of God that is on every man under the sound of my voice. If, if you've got a made up mind in this place and you're accepting the call of God today, would you just begin to talk to him right where you are? Come on, just begin to lift your voice. Just begin to open your mouth and talk to him. I'm wondering if there are a group of men in this place who say, you know what? I'm gonna fight for my family. I'm gonna fight for the future. I'm gonna fight for right. I'm gonna fight to be a godly example in this day and age. I'm gonna be godly and masculine 
Is there anybody that would just say, you know what? I'm going to make a decision today to stand up and stand out and be who God is calling me to be. We are, we are celebrating a generation today that's got a made up mind. A group of men who say, you know what? It doesn't matter what comes my way. I am making my stand today. I am making my decision to lead my family and to set an example. If that's you, just lift your voice up just a little bit more. We are a group of men who are declaring the name of Jesus Christ over our family and over our future and over this church. We will not be defeated. We not, will not be sidetracked. We will not let the secondary supplant God's primary purpose for our lives and for our families and for our future. God, let us be spiritual men. Let us be in tune with you. Let us hear your voice. Let us follow your heart. Ladies all across this building, will you lift your voice and stretch out your hand and pray for these godly men who are crying out to God right now. Will you join us? Will you intercede for the godly men gathered in this altar right now? God, I thank you that you've given men and women specific roles to play in your kingdom. And God, I pray for a fresh anointing on this Father's Day. On every man under the sound of my voice to hear your voice and to draw closer to you so that we become strong enough to carry our families, our children, our wives, and our futures into the new world and new future that you have for us, oh God. God, we declare it, we receive it, we make our stand, we make our commitment today. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. God, I pray that you would raise up a generation of warriors for you. God, men who would be mighty in battle, men who would be wise, men who would be strong, but men who would be kind, men who would be good to their families, oh God. God, I pray that you would make us all more like you. Let every father become like our heavenly father. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. God, we declare your name, your word, your goodness over every man in this place. We speak your word and your name over our families, oh God. And we declare that our best days are on the way. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Come on, lift your voice. Shout Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains. Jesus in the street. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Shout Jesus, Shout Jesus from the mountain. Jesus in the streets. Jesus in Just keep going to the right place. Just keep carrying your family into this house. Keep showing your babies how to pray and how to walk with God and how to study. You just keep doing it. You just get up and you keep doing it. Why? Why? Because the highest calling on you is not about you. It's about your future. It's about the next generation. If you make it and they don't, you failed. If I make it and my family doesn't, I have failed. I made up in my mind a long time ago, I am not going to heaven alone. I'm not going to heaven alone. I'm taking my wife with me. I'm taking my kids with me. I'm taking as many people in this church that want to go with me. Why? Because that is the call of God to me. Can you carry them? Will you bring them with you? Will you show them the way? Do you have a made up mind? If you do, will you lift up a praise? Why don't you lift up a men's conference praise right now? Why don't you lift your voice? Why don't you get a shout in your feet and say, I've made up my mind. I'm gonna be the father he's called me to be. I'm gonna be the leader he's called me to be. I'm gonna be the pastor he's called me to be. I'm gonna be the man that God is calling me to be. Amen. As a man, as a father, 
You can call it old fashioned if you want to, but your job and mine is to carry the stuff that nobody else can carry. So if you got a made up mind today and you, you've made it up in your heart, you know what? I'm gonna do everything in my power to carry my family forward, to move my family forward, to move my legacy forward, to move my children forward, to move my wife forward, to move the church forward, to move the kingdom of God forward. If that's you, and you've got a made up mind, I wish one time before we leave this place today, you would lift up a shout that would rise.